Hello world, and welcome to another episode of the Genius Podcast. Um, This week, we're going to be talking about all the new hotness. We're going to be talking about new Apple releases. We're going to be talking about NFTs. Um, So this episode is really geared towards our creatives and our entrepreneurs and um, uh, folks in the business of, I say creatives, yeah, because you're creating something unique and collectible, something that we value in society. We value art. So I'm super excited for us to talk about um, NFTs this week. But first, let's talk about Apple releases. So Joshua, the the Apple event was on, was on Tuesday. Tuesday. Mm-hmm. That was the 20th. Mm-hmm. So uh, I expect that it's around Earth Day. So they had a lot of things that were kind of hinged on environmental awareness. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then they announced new products. So what new products are we looking at? coming down the pipeline from Apple? Um, so one of the big ones that we've been uh, waiting on as users, uh, Apple. <laughs> Apple finally uh, released AirTags. Um, AirTags are a uh, basically kind of a, a small device. Um, it's a, about maybe as big as a quarter, maybe a little bit bigger than a quarter. Um, and you just attach it or keep it uh, or adhere it to an item of yours, such as like a backpack or your purse or a set of keys. And uh, in your Find My application, it lists as an item uh, in that list. So uh, for iPhone users and iOS users, uh, there's a Find My application. Um, It's a white application with a a green kind of GPS locator icon on it. It looks like the radar. When radar, the radar is yep. spinning and it bing, pings off, that's, right. yeah, the graphic. So, yeah, so when, when you uh, hit that application and you sign in with your iCloud information, you see all of the uh, devices that you're signed in with your iCloud account. And then or your family. If you are set up as a family, you see all the family devices. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and then also uh, with the new items, uh, the items category, with air tags, you'll now be able to see all of the uh, items that you would hear in air tag to, right? So uh, we've been waiting for air tags for uh, uh, probably for maybe like last year and a half, maybe two years now. Um, even some, maybe even a little bit longer, because uh, I think tile has been around. I was about to say, people are maybe more familiar with tile, because um, that was sold in the Apple stores. Because that's kind of like the industry leader as far as something that you can put on a personal item mm-hmm. to be able to track it as a, you know, like a tracking device. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And so, you what know, advantages uh, are we getting with air tags over what Tile has already, I guess, put in the marketplace? For sure. So, one, um, air tags is integrated with iOS. Right, so automatically when you uh, connect it to, uh, you do the setup through your iPhone, it's on, it's automatically integrated with your iCloud account. So more intuitive experience Correct. for the customer. Okay. Um, and then there's the what we call the Find My Network. Okay, um, the Find My Network is built on top of uh, the Find My application and built on top of iCloud, to where if you lose an AirTag. Right or misplace an air tag or misplace an item. Of course, that's a here to to one of those air tags. Uh, you can. Uh, uh, You're talking keys, wallet, backpack, purse. Right. Like the personal stuff, items. Yeah, you can tag that uh, that item as lost, and other people that uh, use the Find My Network, which is most people sign into their iCloud account. Uh, we the network uses in proximity phones that are around your item to boost the network yes to and then it will notify people to say hey this item has been lost okay then from there if they find your item they can take their iphone scan it scan the air tag and then your your contact information will show up so if you leave you know your backpack at the airport or in the back of a uber or on the back of a uber or on the airplane right um people can find it Use, use their iPhone, scan your AirTag, and automatically find who is the owner of this device. As well as um, the AirTag comes with the U1 chip. And a, the U1 chip is just a, a special chip that helps with uh, precise location data. And so uh, with the U1 chip built into the AirTag, uh, you can use your iPhone to do directional location of your uh, of your item. And it Precision will bring it- finding is the... The feature precision yeah. finding precision yeah. finding yeah 100 percent. so instead of it being a general location it has like an arrow that 
will guide you like a kind of like a compass you just correct so for it. for those that have uh airpods um you know you can go on your uh, on your find my app and see your airpods listed however it's not going to give you a precise location to where you can find it right underneath your couch it's going to say that it's in your house but with the u1 chip with the air tag you'll be able to find this precisely underneath the couch or nestled in um, uh, behind a backboard or behind a dresser because it will give you directional and precise location or in the car because you know that's where um when things drop in the car that's where th- <laughs> they go into like Narnia or something, dog. There's like mm-hmm. a black hole down there. Um, so we have air tags. Um, what else are we looking forward to from this release? Uh, Apple Card family. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have uh, utilized the benefit of Apple Card. I have Apple Card myself. Um, and Apple Card is basically just Apple's version of a credit card, right? Um, and it integrates right with iCloud. It integrates with your wallet. Um, and it's really good for if you are an Apple uh, product user, uh, like myself, an Avid user, um, buying products with the Apple Card is uh, really good because it, it, it helps you boost your credit. Um, they give you a really good cash back um, on the card. And with Apple Card Family, now you can start to attach other family members so you can share credit u- utilization. You build credit mm-hmm. together as opposed to it just building your credit as an individual. Correct, correct. So this will be good for spouses. This would be good for families if uh, you want to attach your uh, attach your um, attach your kids uh, to or it, or if you want to, or you know, I mean, you know, some people have friends, uh, really, really close friends that they look at as family. You might be able to attach them, right? That's not good friends. So, <laughs> yeah, so you know, um, it just opens up that opportunity to um, help uh, people build their credit. You know, in this time with you know how much uh, devices are right now spending two three thousand dollars up front uh for some of these uh higher end products may not be feasible at one time right so uh to be able to boost your credit uh to be able to share that with a uh a higher uh credit scored family member is just a is just a, a, a really beneficial option at this time um so yeah so that's apple car family i know what i'm excited about from the apple launch what's that you know what i'm saying i'm excited about the ipad pro Yo, yo, the iPad Pro. The iPad Pro is nice. The iPad Pro is very, very nice. The smaller screen I see as more for like casual users or people who are like lightweight into like using it for its creative potential, video editing, drawing, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the larger screen, that 12.9 inch screen, that one is for like powerhouse creatives. Mm-hmm. And all the technology that they like pack into that iPad from the screen. Look, I'm overwhelmed. So with joy. <laughs> and so you guys can see how aesthetic she sounds. Uh, I use an iPad more as an auxiliary device. I don't use it as a main device. I'm more of a, a tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I use more laptops, desktops, and I'm a pro uh, pro user on my iPhone. Um, but the iPad is now uh, going to be integrated with the M1 chip. Right, and so we talked about before um, about this how Apple M1 chip is, shit up. I have a uh, Mac Mini here in my shop. I uh, bought the uh, M1 version uh, about two months ago, um, and it's the the efficiency is glorious. Right, um, I have so many drives connected to it. I'm doing, um, uh, I'm transmitting massive amounts of data over my Ethernet cable um, to certain servers here to be for for diagnostics. Um, I'm able to run all of my pro applications on it, and I, I haven't seen a significant lag. Um, and I've been doing all of our editing on that computer as well, and it's been a, like a marked upgrade from my MacBook Pro. My 15-inch MacBook Pro is a beast, but like mm-hmm. that computer is a one. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, we had iMovie running at one time, Xcode, um, I think Photoshop, Safari, and a couple of uh, a couple other utility app. I've been using Adobe Illustrator. I've been using my Adobe Suite on there, and yeah. I don't skip a beat at all. Yeah, it, so it's, I'm I'm pleased. So with that efficiency now brought into uh, the iPad Pro, um, I think the uh, the creatives uh, that really use the iPad as an easel, bro, right? The fact that I could take an external hard drive, connect via Thunderbolt, you have no idea, like. 
the size of the files that when you're working in Photoshop, you're working in Illustrator, or you're editing 4K video in iMovie, or you're making music in GarageBand or Logic or what have you, like these programs take a lot of computing power and the files that are generated from these programs are really big. Mm -hmm. So being able to work the intuitive like experience of drawing on the iPad is the closest that I've gotten to drawing on like physical paper, but it reduces the workflow as an artist because you don't have to keep redrawing the same drawings a whole bunch of time to get to concept. Mm -hmm. Like you could just, it's easier to build on the foundations because you're working in layers. Mm -hmm. Um, so being able to take advantage of the screen that comes with the iPad and then pairing it with the computing power that you need to really push these programs. So like this new iPad, I've always wanted to get more into, um, augmented reality, like drawing, like, let's say I have a, a art gallery exhibition I can create, I want to create like all like augmented reality, like insta installations in the gallery, but you would need to encounter it through the use of an iPad or an iPhone to really, you know, get that augmented reality of the piece. And these iPads are allowing artists to create digital art in a way that we never have before. So like people who are doing architecture, like you can completely, your whole blueprint, your concept, your design, all that stuff you can generate in the iPad, actually go to the site and use augmented reality to show your clients, this is what my design is gonna look like and really give them that wow moment and that impact of, you know, like all these things working in tandem. So I think it, it presents a lot of potential for creatives. So if you can't tell, I'm like, really excited mm -hmm. <laughs> about that particular release as as just a note to the display um so you're looking at uh they're naming it the liquid retina display pixel perfect portability uh 600 nits peak brightness true tone for comfort viewing pro motion adaptive 120 hertz refresh rate and P3 wide color gamut. So for people, for, <laughs> for people who are listening to this and they're like, what the heck is Joshua saying right now? This don't make no sense. If you're a gamer and you want a game on the go and have the experience that you have with a console, that's how powerful this iPad is. Mm -hmm. Like you're literally walking around with a computer in your hand, like don't drop it. <laughs> Oh jeez, <laughs> cause what we we priced out one last night. Yeah, and they night. come with like two terabytes of storage, like mm -hmm. uh, two so two so, terabytes. Right, right, but we priced it out right. So mm -hmm. the the one that is two terabytes comes with sixteen gigs of RAM. Correct. Right. Like, so there's a there's iPod. yeah there's a one twenty eight there's a two fifty six five twelve so those three those three one twenty eight two fifty six five twelve come with eight gigs of RAM, but the two terabyte and what was it? It's a one terabyte one, option. One terabyte, one terabyte and a two terabyte, they come, they come with 16, with 16 gigs, gigs of RAM. RAM. For people who don't understand, like Oof. when we're talking about computer storage versus Oof. the RAM, your RAM is like your desk space. The bigger your desk, the more um, projects you could have going simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So having eight versus 16, maybe I need to multitask between several programs that I'm editing a movie, I'm designing graphics with that are going files. in the yeah. movie with large files. This all takes a lot of computing power. So mm -hmm. the more desk space or the more RAM I have, the easier it is for my computer to multitask efficiently. Mm -hmm. So it's key. Beautiful, beautiful, okay. Uh, next on the next? list. Next, okay. So uh, candy IMAX. Candy IMAX. Well, how okay, we're them candy IMAX. We're gonna hold on candy IMAX. <laughs> we're gonna hold on can candy IMAX. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come back to the product. I want to talk about a service. Service. I want to talk about uh, the podcast app subscriptions. Ooh, good one. Yeah, right. We're gonna talk about the podcast app app subscription. So um, I don't know how many of you guys out there uh, have been using podcasts. I've uh, been using the podcast app, uh, but the podcast app has been on iPhone since I want to say the release of the original iPhone, if not the original release, then the uh, first generation, right? The podcast app has been on the Apple platform for a very long time. Um, and the podcast community has been uh, has been small 
in, in uh, uh, I would say probably in the last 10 years, the podcast community has just exploded. But previous to that, people weren't really using the podcast app, right? You know, you I had a... Like you the had, pandemic had a lot to do with the, the real increase of um, engagement with podcasts because mm-hmm. people have more time to listen mm-hmm. and people have time to create. Mm-hmm. So it's like the perfect storm of... For and people, the podcast industry. Yeah, and people are now getting, you know, more comfortable sitting behind a mic, right? That that uh, that anxiety of sitting behind a mic uh, before uh, with the pandemic, with iPhones, with social media has, has kind of uh, decreased that fear of sitting behind, behind a mic. That's what got me behind a mic right now talking to you guys, right? Um, the feeling that I can just put up an iPhone, put up a mic, and just express my opinions on things that I'm passionate about. (laughs) Yeah, that that's really cool to me. So, um, the, the podcast app on, on iPhone, uh, and and iOS has been, I think the best experience of listening to podcasts. Um, but now, uh, with this latest release of podcasts, podcast subscriptions, uh, they're moving into a frame to try to empower, uh, financially, uh, all of the creators in the podcast space. Right. So if you are a podcaster and you have a significant following or following or even if you're growing your following, uh, if you have uh, they had, had it's a, a new monetization model for our creatives. In yeah. The yeah. So, you okay. know, if, so if you kind have of like how only fans or um, Patreon, Patreon is the other one that a mm-hmm. lot of people use. Mm-hmm. You create tiers of like a paywall. You have paid content. You have free content. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, there, there hasn't they, the podcast community has had to figure out creative ways of monetizing their ads and yeah yeah where there be ads sponsorships are trying to figure out what the uh, value is in the podcasting space so to have an what integrated the app be forward like trash. right to have an integrated app that now allows you to uh, to set tiers right for your following and that also gives you some robust analytics and metrics that you can look at and crunch and be able to give to and showcase to other companies or be able to show show your value the value of the podcast yeah it's going to make uh it's going to open up the doors for more podcasters to come onto the platform and it's going to increase the overall value of of the industry um so kudos to apple for coming out with this i think that this is a really good step yeah it's long overdue um i think it's a great step in independence for creatives um especially in in the podcast and audio space um, and I'm, I look forward to see what, what comes from it. Yeah. It's more than new hotness. It's more than new hotness. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So the, now the candy IMAX. Yeah. The candy IMAX. You know, I like that. You know, I like that pop-up color. So um, the candy IMAX uh, hints back to the retro. Yeah. I mm-hmm. felt like it was a real callback to the... Um, the uh, blueberry mm-hmm. and those really bright colored IMAX. Uh, these IMAX also have uh, the M1 chip, right? I think they come, I think it's seven colors that they come come with. Um, and so This is going to be a nightmare for inventory. Like, I could feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> think, think about all the colors that an iPhone 11 comes in. Right, um, and then now you have the MacBooks, watches with all the bands. Watches with all the bands, and then you have computers that are now kind of that you know were in gold, uh, space gray, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a new purple color that was released. Now there's this, a new purple um, iPhone 12 and 12 iPhone 12 and 12 Pro, and that 12 Pro Max. They didn't do the lavender in the 12 Pro Max, mm-hmm. um, uh, but it is uh, the 12 and 12 Pro. Um, but the uh, IMAX, right, the IMAX are now integrated with the M1 chip, right? So they're getting that new technology, that new brain from Apple. So that's the iMac, the MacBook Air, 13-inch MacBook Pro, uh, and the Mac Mini, uh, and, and the iPad Pro that now have Who is Apple's left to be brought, chip. brought into the M1, the 16-inch I'm sensitive about MacBook this topic. Pro, because it's like the last one. It's the last... The, the they're they're talking about uh, bringing out between a 14 to 16 inch MacBook Pro, and they're talking about uh, them bringing back ports. So ports like HDMI ports, it. SD card slot, um, Thunderbolt ports, as well as USB C ports. We'll see, and then also this bringing back and then also bringing masses. back MagSafe to the oh, Mac, yeah. right? So getting back to the iMacs, iMacs now have. Um, they MagSafe. now have MagSafe. They have a special uh, uh, power connector that's MagSafe that goes back into the screen, right, for power. There's the power brick, right? The power brick. There's only two, uh, two US. Uh, no, no, two. Yeah, yeah, two USB-C ports 
on this iMac. And two Thunderbolt. There isn't any regular USB. I guess yeah. USB three is what it's called. Correct. And then the Ethernet port is connected to the power the power brick, right? So that's going to be on on the floor. That's connected to the power brick. Um, and then the uh, the audio jack is on the side of the iMac now. The majority of the computer is the display, right? The logic board is maybe about this long. As right? supposed to be in like three or almost four times that size. Correct, right? So the efficiency of this computer is going to be astronomical, right? And I'm very excited to see um, uh, what comes from this, uh, what projects are built in this. I'm excited to see what colors are going to be out there because these are some. I like uh, there's uh, like a marigold color. That yeah, would be my choice. It these had are some really one, iconic real and Easter vibes. Yeah, very the, spring esque with this um this with these colors. I'm excited to see because you know I go around here and work in uh, people's offices. I go into their homes, um, so I get to work on their personal systems. So I'm excited to see uh, you know what colors people choose. Um, I think the the color options are really cool. Um, but now with the iMac being integrated with the M1. Um, power efficiency coming into the desktop is is going to be on par uh, now with the iPads and with the Mac, the MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs. Okay, cool. Um, let's we have see. one last thing: Apple TV 4K. Apple TV. Apple, Apple TV. TV hasn't. Apple TV isn't a very popular um, item. I feel the iPhone is kind of like the gateway drug. Mm -hmm. And then people get a laptop or an iPad, mm -hmm. but not a lot of people have Apple TVs, and it hasn't been refreshed in like three or four years. So, so what do we get now with Apple TV 4K? So a couple cool things. Uh, one being uh, now you have a uh, a new remote, right? For people that use the previous versions of the Apple remote, uh, the physical Apple remote, the it was controlled by multi gestures. Right, so it had kind of like a glass screen, and you had to maneuver your thumb over the glass screen to get the cursor to move. Now it has a traditional dial, right, and the Siri button is on the right. Um, while I think that that is, um, I, th I think it's more functional for people that may not uh, be used to multi gestures with their with their finger. It it's might a be a call back to the iPod Classic. Yeah, so yeah. So it's gonna give people a lot of comfort in that, you know. You're able to How rotate your thumb on the dial. You're, you're able experience. to have some uh, more physical clicks within the button. However, I'm interested to see how that works with gaming uh, because the multi-gestures were really uh, were really cool for some of the uh, Apple TV games, right? So in the they Apple TV... Like controllers and stuff that people use. That's right, like but it was also experience. really cool that my Apple remote, I could also flip and that was a gaming controller, right? That, yeah. that was pretty cool for me. And then you get excited and you drop it and you break it because, you know, that's so, another screen for people to break and my apple remote and screens on the apple tv remote my apple remote is chip right now you see but you know <laughs> you see <laughs> <laughs> i still like my old apple remote the new apple remote is cool um i think that is going to be more functional for people that uh, may not be used to multi gestures i get that um but just me i like the nostalgia of the old one um the second thing about apple tv 4k that i think is cool of course it's in 4k hence the name apple tv 4k um, but it also helps with the adjustment of the colors in your TV, right? So um, if you're using the Apple TV to view content, it's going to automatically adjust the settings for certain TVs or for more modern TVs. Um, it's going to adjust those uh, brightness settings and color settings to give you the most vivid and efficient video coming from your screen. So right? make so, your dumb TV a smart TV. Basically, you're less an intelligent TV and more. Yeah, TV. yeah. So you don't have to go in and adjust those settings yourself. The uh, the algorithms in the Apple TV would automatically do that for you. Um, so if you don't have an, an, an Apple TV, this would be a good time to get one if you're under, if if you're a new uh, on oncomer uh, to the product. Um, I think it's really cool. Um, it also affords you um, the integration of all the other platforms. So the Apple TV, if you guys aren't aware of what it is, um, it's just like a Amazon you get Fire Netflix, Stick. Hulu. Uh, yeah, you, you get games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, iOS games. You so for those that like to play iOS, Floppy uh, Bird yep, and you get, They have and Apple TV kind of versions of those apps. Um, so the gaming community, you can get into that as well. Um, and it also has pairs their own content that they yes. do as well. Um, and you can also pair your uh, gaming uh, your gaming controllers with the Apple TV as well. That's an Apple TV. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the only last notable thing, not technically a product release, 
more a release of information mm -hmm. as far as what Apple is giving artists per stream because it was it wasn't very clear what artists were getting every time you stream their song. Mm -hmm. So what is it? What so, is Apple saying yeah, that yeah. artists uh, get? So Apple came out and you know just made it very clear that uh, one stream equals one penny, right? So one stream, from my understanding, I have a couple of friends that uh, work for Spotify, that work for Sony, um, and conversations that I've had with them um, have been, you know, uh, a stream is if your song is played, it has to be played more than 30 seconds for it to count as a stream, right? Mm -hmm. And it has to be a unique stream, right? Um, like you can't have the same Apple, I um, assume it's the same login, uh, doing the same stream within a certain period of time. And on loop? Yeah, can't yeah, you can't do it on loop on, because on loop? there's algorithms that are, that are watching that. So the metrics for it to count well, as really a stream. Like, song, like I want you to get your streams. Listen, listen, it, it's Look, there's strict my, rules. The one, I love my sister, but I hate the fact that when she love a song, she don't really like put it on loop. Like you know how I have repeat one time and then like repeat into perpetuity. That's a fan. Like she don't run that song in. Oh. That's a fan. Bless. <laughs> Bless. And so uh, there, there are strict rules for uh, for your song to count as a stream, right? Number two, um, the payout for a stream, right? So artists will say that, yeah, I'm getting paid one penny for my stream. Well, if you're not independent, if your uh, account is not directly rela uh, uh, connected to the iTunes account that the payouts go through, for uh for publishing and royalties that means the majority of that money is usually sent out to the record labels the record labels split that money first and then you get your cut so yeah the record label That's gets paid a penny like but you nothing. get a fraction of the penny right just think about that the record label gets a penny per stream and then as an artist you know if you know depending upon you how your contract is pennies. set up you may get a tenth let me get a, a point five. It's real bad out here for artists, right? Because Spotify, right? Spotify is paying, uh, I think, a third of this. So you're getting twenty five cents to twenty five to fifty oh, cents. Because Spotify got give Apple a, a portion of the revenue that they're making in their ads. Ah, oh, damn. You're getting about I'm a third to again. a half. So twenty five to fifty five, some somewhere in there. Right. You know, but 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 there's more there's more artists that are on the Spotify platform than they are on the Apple platform. So if your music is being streamed more on Spotify, you're getting paid less. Go ahead. Damn. That's that's rough. You see, creators when they talk about the starving artists, it's not because the artist is in lack of work, <laughs> like paying work. Like after I you done bust down all the money, what is left? You know? So the splits. Correct. So when we start transitioning to talking about things like NFTs, ding 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 ding. We start talking about creatives taking control over the ownership and distribution of their art. In whatever form it exists in, because art is not just drawing and painting, it's music you know poetry like all of these things videos they all count as art mm -hmm. um or something that can be unique when we start talking about what an nft actually is and how it's structured so before we roll right through into nfts we just have a notable mention as far as tech news that's coming out because um we already have one um the first economy to roll out a digital currency backed by their government was the Bahamas, Central Bank of the Bahamas. Um, but now we have our first major economy rolling out digi a digital currency to its citizens. And I'm talking about China, you know? Mm -hmm. So China is the first big country it's taken them seven years to get to this rollout point. Um, they're rolling the currency out in two tiers. Um, and that is in an effort to, since it's backed by the central bank, they didn't want the, you know, I guess privately owned banks to get scared. <laughs> so they're doing a distribution through 
the other banks to make it available to a wide array of Chinese citizens. Um, so a lot of um, commercial stores in China, like Apple, Starbucks, McDonald's, McDonald's have mm-hmm. been quick to say they're going to accept this currency. Um, but of course, you know, <laughs> the U.S. is looking at China. The Federal Reserve is now like, um, we are seriously considering putting out a some form of digital currency for the American public. Mm-hmm. Because long term, the worry is the um the nature of this digital currency and it being available in china is gonna weaken the u.s dollar because it's exist it doesn't exist in a space where it relies on the u.s dollar which is our current system Mm -hmm. so that that's just a notable mention as far as like what's going on right now with cryptocurrency and and its adoption yeah and just as a note on that before before we move on um with China taking this stance, right, the um, the onset, right, or uh, the approval of digital currency in a uh, in a in a large onset is going to increase. And what I mean by that, you know, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a little pebble before the bull that yeah, comes Yeah, yeah, you know that. There's a lot of people that are saying that cryptocurrency is a is a fad. A flash in the pan. Yeah, that it's not that's not going away. I'm assuming that that's going to be going away um, here. You know, it, it, all all the high investors, all the people, all the celebrities are just hyping it up. It's not really a thing. Even Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's not it's not a thing. It's just something cool that people are putting money by to boost the price, and it's going to fall flat on its face in a couple of years. If you you know, I was watching a podcast. Uh, uh, and the gentleman that was speaking, you know, he said a statement. He said, if you truly know what the blockchain is and what that's going to provide for you as an individual, as a citizen of a government, you see the potential of how big this is going to be, right? The, the decentralization of finance is going to trickle over into so many other industries to where the middlemen that used to be the government or some government sponsored company is going to be removed. And I'll leave it there. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> okay, so let's roll up into NFTs. Um, NFT stands for non-fungible token. Mm-hmm. What the heck does that even mean? Boom. So as we talk about cryptocurrency, right? A non-fungible token. Well, so let's talk about what fungible is first. So fungible is something that could be traded like for like, right? So um, the best example of that is money, right? If I have a dollar and you have a dollar, if we trade these dollars, they're of equal value. I could give you four quarters and it'll still be a dollar. Right. So the the trading of currency, right, and our uh, and our version of money is fungible. It's something that can be traded like for like. Non fungible means that we can't trade this like for like. Uh, a good example of that is art, right? So it's um, something that's unique. Right. Collectible. So if, if I have a Mona Lisa painting. I may not be able to trade that for, I don't know, um, the painting of Ronald McDonald, right? The Mona Lisa painting, even though that they're both pieces of art, they don't hold the, the same, same value. amount of value, right? The value is set based on what the community is valuing this particular piece, okay? And the scarcity yes. of mm-hmm. it, the mm-hmm. number, like if it's a one of one, if mm-hmm. it's a five of five, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, the the valuation of a fungible, uh, uh, excuse me, of a non fungible is based on scarcity, right? And it's based on the um, the approval of a community, and right? it being authentic, and then uh, then the authentication. Because yes. it's like when you sign your art, mm-hmm. like people try to replicate works of art all the time but like if it's not a real work of art, it's not gonna be worth as much. Mm-hmm. Or if it's a print. It's not worth as much as a physical like painting or sketch. Mm-hmm. So that that's the concept of an NFT at the at the beginning, right? It's a it's a token 
right? A that, unique token. A unique token, right, that is scarce, right, that can be proven uh, to have, uh, to the, the authentication of it can be proven, and it is uh, something that is publicly distributed or something that everybody can see. Before I get into further explanation of that, I wanted, Sarah, can you, can you give a little bit of an explanation of where the current art market is for art? What is it like to navigate the art space? Yes. Um, it can be very difficult because the art space is very um, exclusive. Um, so just being like a newcomer to the art scene, it can be a little elitist sometimes because it's like the the type of people that are paying big money for art are like not to call them bougie but like high rolling people like you could afford to throw a couple thousand on a painting like you know you're in a whole different tax bracket so being able to penetrate the market um to sell work is a little difficult because it's a little exclusive um so i would say that's kind of like the biggest obstacle Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as we talk more about the technology behind an NFT, we talk about the blockchain, right? And the blockchain is basically this large public digital ledger, right? And this large public digital ledger is basically to hold transactions, right, that occur, right? The transition of ownership of tokens. And it also is uh, for security, right? Because the blocks, or the transactions that are validated on the chain are immutable, meaning that they cannot be changed. Because okay? everybody's copy has to be the same everybody's for it to copy. be valid. Exactly. So the uh, NFTs are currently right are currently supported by the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, so there's some question mm-hmm. as you're kind of moving in this direction. If I'm an artist and I want to make an NFT. Or if I'm a consumer, I'm an art collector, and I want to purchase an NFT, like, what does that that space look like? So you have to understand the blockchain and Ethereum, right? So the blockchain, like I said, is a place that holds tokens. The way that these tokens are are distributed between one another um, is through public addresses, okay? So I have a public address, you have a public address. If I want to send you a token, I up, uh, I I put in your pub, your public address. I attach the whole token, a part, a point, a, 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 a fraction of the token, whatever denomination of the, uh, or, excuse upon. me, um, whatever percentage of the token I want to send. I can specify that that I can send that to you o- over the blockchain. What the blockchain then does, it records that transaction. It records the removal of how many tokens I have and then the uh, increase into your side of how many tokens you have. And it keeps this ledger public. So all of the computers, there's millions of computers that are validating these transactions. And every single computer that is on this network has a public registry of that transaction. So all the way back to the first transaction, we can always see who owned what and where did transactions happen that transferred ownership. Can I add in like a a key piece for creatives in this process that is presented with NFTs? Mm -hmm. When that transaction happens, I can say, okay, I have uh, this sunflower painting. Um, It's a one of one. It's worth 200 um, Ethereum coins. And if it's ever resold, I get 10%. Mm Mm-hmm. So I can dictate because I still retain copyright for my art, but if it's sold to another person on the blockchain, I still get my royalty, so to speak. So the NFT is wrapped in what we call a, a smart contract. Okay, and a smart contract is basically just code that specifies the rules of the uh, of this NFT. So, like Sarah said, if I create this NFT. I can attach, right? The really cool thing about this is that I can attach any form of media. I can uh, I can attach text, photos, videos, gifs, any form of media that I want to attach to this NFT. I can attach it. 
once I do that, the smart contract can then say, okay, when this is uh, transferred over or when somebody purchases this and initiates that transaction, what are the rules? What are the parameters on the sale? Does this artist retain 10% royalties? So for instance, if I were to sell Sarah a $100 NFT, she would then go and sell it for $1,000. I would receive 10% back from that, right? If then that person would then go sell it for a million dollars, I would then, I need my 10% back. And that automatically happens on the chain. There's no uh, you don't uh, go there's no authority, for your money. <laughs> right? There, there's no authority that you have to go to to say, "Hey, give me my money." It's automatically coded in the smart contract. And like I said, the power of the blockchain is that it is immutable. Once it is validated on there, once it is uh, 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 verified by the all the of these millions of computers. of computers, it is there and it cannot be changed. I'm with it. I'm with it. So, uh, so, like, so your your other question was how um, as how, a user, yeah, I want to purchase. You want to purchase. So how do I go about? It? You said it's on Ethereum. So mm -hmm. of course I would have to use a digital wallet. Yeah. So example. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna explain this more from uh, from the consumer side. There are other technical ways of um, of transacting on the Ethereum network, but I think it would be best for me to explain the consumer side. So. Um, there are platforms that you can sign up for, right? One platform is Coinbase. Again, Coinbase. Coinbase is an application that for free you can download on your uh, download on your phone. Coinbase is a place where you can buy cryptocurrency such as Ethereum, and you can store cryptocurrency such as Ethereum. That's our neighbor. Um, we can store cryptocurrency and we can buy cryptocurrency in that application you can attach your bank account or I, I i can't i can't remember if they have the if you can attach a debit card or not but i know for sure i know for sure that you can attach your bank account information and so when you want to buy cryptocurrency you just select how much currency you want to buy and USD, it transacts and it'll right it transacts that for you so you don't have to go through any special protocols right there are ways to then connect that wallet to other platforms, right? There are some really cool platforms that have come out, uh, such as uh, we're going to put all these links down here um, in the Resources, description. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, but Nifty Gateways, right? Nifty Gateways is a, a really cool, cool, cool platform that you can go on to sign up for an account, attach your uh, uh, bank account information, and they create a digital wallet for you, right? They create a digital wallet for you. Think about. Um, your digital wallet uh, being your bank account, just in a digital form, right? You guys go to ATMs and pull money out of we the ATM. We send money <laughs> digitally through cash time. and Venmo all the time, right? The the cryptocurrency digital wallet is basically the same concept, right? It's the same concept as Venmo or Cash App, right? This digital money sitting there waiting for you to either be transferred to somebody else or uh, uh, or flipped for actual fiat money, which is USD, which is actual cash money. So Nifty Gateways is, uh, you can go on the platform, sign up for an account and start buying crypto, I'm assuming start buying NFTs. Um, there's another platform called Rareable, um, that's rareable.com. Um, same as Nifty, just uh, they have a different curation model for uh, how they present the artists that are on the platform. Uh, there's another one called Top Shot. Top Shot is for, uh, I believe, the NBA right now to where you say, can those do are like highlights. Sports highlights. Yeah, sports highlights. So for basketball fans that you don't want to see, collect, really... how people collect baseball cards. Yeah. People collect the, they're like, uh, it's almost like a GIF. It's mm -hmm. like a short video highlight reel of a sports player. Correct. So for those that understand the market of collectibles, right? That understand the market of sports cards and how valuable sports cards are or how valuable um, uh, sports memorabilia is, uh, Top Shot is a great platform for you to buy some of that uh, digital artwork, which is wrapped in NFT. The last one is um, Autograph. Autograph is a company that uh, was pioneered by Tom Brady. Uh, Tom Brady uh, is coming out with, it's, it's a concept similar to Top Shot. Um, but it's going to be a place where you can buy celebrity NFTs um, and rare NFTs um, from some notable people around the world. 
Um, so that if you want to get into the NFT game, I if you want to be, okay, yeah, go ahead. but um. but the but the real cool <laughs> thing of these platforms, right? And so we talk about the democratization of the art market, right? We talk about being able to get fine art into the everyday consumer, right? We talk about access, right? We talk about artists being able to have a platform where they can sell their art, where they don't have to go through gatekeepers. Right, they don't have to go talk to uh, this person that runs this curated uh, gallery, and I have to get in here before seeing anybody can see my art. And you don't have to go through all that, right? Mm -hmm. If you have cool stuff, if you have if you have unique art, right, things that resonate with people that you can put into a digital format, this might be a platform for you. This might be a marketplace for you, right? I, I'm, I'm I already have at least ten ideas for NFTs, right? <laughs> I got a lot, but I think Sarah's about to yeah, talk, uh, talk I, about the I other was, side of the coin. I was about to say, I got very, very excited by the concept of NFTs. And then the <laughs> the environmental warrior that rages in my heart said, can we talk about the environmental impact that this technology is having? What is the power consumption involved? Because I don't want to go careening down the path of uh, uh, climate <laughs> catastrophe. Um, I love art, but I love my planet. So Agreed. I don't want to, you know, we're trying to go backward on this path of uh, our decreasing our carbon footprint. How much energy does it take to mint an NFT? Yes. So uh, to directly answer your question, uh, it's around uh, 254 kilowatt hours. What is that in what is that context uh, here on the island? So 30 kilowatt hours, 30 to 32, um, I think is the average that one household uses here on the island. In right. A day, in, in, in a, a day, week? in a day. So about 30 to 32. So you're looking at about uh, a week of power consumption. A week's worth of power consumption on the network to mint um, one, one standard NFT. Okay. And the, here's my here's my next question. Mm -hmm. Do we know how much? Uh, what is the distribution of renewable? Like these computers that are on the network. So who is it, using renewable resources? Mm -hmm. I know you may not. You know, I'm just saying who. What percentage of people on this blockchain network are utilizing renewable resources to power the network as opposed to fossil fuels? Got you. So, I don't know the uh, I don't know the specific uh, percentage. This is just where my brain goes. But this is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to explain to you why it takes so much power. Okay. The computers on the blockchain, like I said, there's millions of them. Right. And all of these computers are trying to validate transactions. They're trying to make sure that the uh, integrity of the network is very, very high. Right. Um, damn near infallible. Right. And so to do that, there's a lot of computing power that has to go into validating, uh, validating these transactions all over the world. Um, to mint an NFT, like I said, takes 250 watt. Uh, 254 kilowatt hours so that's the amount of power that these uh, computers are pulling out of the wall to mint this process is called minting because they are uh, uh, they are creating the token right and in the creation of that token excuse me and in the the creation of that token is done under what we call proof of work okay proof of work is the it, it, are, are the computers going through the validation process that takes time that takes computing power that takes energy okay there's another form that is called proof of stake okay and the ethereum blockchain right the ethereum blockchain the ethereum network is based on proof of stake right now which means that all of the computers working on that network are working very, very hard individually and some in mining pools, but working very, very hard to validate these transactions. The Ethereum network is supposed to be transitioning over to proof of stake. 
and proof of stake is basically saying that, hey, there's a large percentage of miners in this area, in this area, in this area. So we're going to basically take our validating, uh, our validating structure and base it off of these other larger pools as opposed to all of the smaller ones. So it's going to decrease the amount of energy used. Now, uh, the, another way to offset that is to use renewable energy, but renewable energy to, to get it up and going and the infrastructure is just taking time. They're working on it, but it, it's taking time. So this is a new emerging technology that's really cool, but because it's so far we some out. some limitations yeah, as we, far as we're, energy consumption. And that's just, you know, you know with, tech, with technology, that is, that is the, that's the dance with the devil right you have to you have to balance that you have to figure out okay how this is a great technology Efficiency. i think it's going to be really cool but how do i equalize that to the carbon footprint that i'm leaving on the earth right how do you balance that so renewable energy excuse me renewable energy seems like the solution to that but the uh we need to the infrastructure is just renewables. yeah so it's just taking a it's just taking a while this fossil fuel business here I, I i don't know the percentage of how many houses here on saint thomas have solar power but i would probably bet it's below 10 10 percent right in 2021 with an area that has as a much abundant uh solar power that you know is close here to the equator that has uh the longest exposure to the sun i don't understand why this island well, is not, not taking solar power. and so that shows you how it's being you know utilized across the world so hopefully as we see uh renewable and energy we're not increase to, to solar yeah it was yeah 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 <laughs> just, that's just, just we're right not limited so you know as other renewable energy sources become more efficient and become uh, uh more widespread hopefully we'll see the carbon footprint of the blockchain decrease because it's not only nfts right we're talking about any coin that is uh being worked on the chain whether that's bitcoin litecoin uh dodge or doggy coin right <laughs> um any of those coins right they run on a chain which means that there's computers that have to validate those transactions which means that they're using power so if you're in cryptocurrency right if you're in the market if you're in the industry if you hold it Don't you support it. you support that right now Right, you are supporting that right now. So become more aware. Contributing to it. Yes, you are. Uh, you are a contributor. So figure out what your contribution is and see how you can help offset your carbon footprint. Okay, um, let's see. What was my other in regards? Oh yes. So my I have two dreams. My dream is that we adopt renewable energy wholeheartedly to help drive the technology and then my second dream is that quantum computers come to fuck uh, shit yes. up because mm -hmm. they're so much more efficient mm -hmm. that i see that combined with more you know stable renewable you know a stable supply of renewable energy i, I don't i don't i don't mean to cut you off but that. but a note to that is so the proof of work is the computer basically competing with other computers to try to see who was faster at figuring out a problem right so it's it's like driving a car and you're in a race you're at the starting line how fast can how how hard can i put my foot on the pedal and go as fast as i can to get to the finish line before this guy and that may burn out all my gas i may use a ton of power to do it but if i can get there first there's a huge reward and that's what proof of work is you get a huge reward i like that analogy as you get a huge reward as a miner if you are able to validate a, a certain group of transactions and create a block on the chain. You get a reward, right? That's the incentive for miners right now, and that's why proof of work is a thing. But as the blockchain becomes more efficient, there's only 21 million Bitcoin. Once all the Bitcoin is mined, hopefully we see Bitcoin transition over to a proof of stake as well. Right? The Ethereum blockchain, which NFT is supported on, is moving over to a... Uh, 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 moving over to a proof of stake. stake structure, but we'll see how long that takes. Okay. Um, let's see. We talked about what non fungible is, how the market is, how I want to talk I about engage. copyright ownership. Oh, yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the copyright ownership piece. Gotcha. Because I know it might be more straightforward with like um, traditional art mm -hmm. um fine art mm -hmm. paintings that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um but with maybe other types of media like music there might be a little bit more of a 
a great area of got understanding. Got you. Um, and so quickly, so um, with with copyrights, when you buy an NFT, right? Let's say you buy a uh, a picture, right? You buy a really really cool picture, and the picture is worth a hundred dollars. You are buying the rights to showcase your piece. So you own it, right? To own that piece, however, it does not give you reproduction and copyrights, right? Or the own the ownership of of the copyright. You can't go make to, prints. Correct. You can't go then monetize this and reproduce it. You can go sell it and transit and uh, 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 sell the ownership, right? When you trend when you transition a piece of art, you are transitioning the ownership of the physical item of the physical item from one person to another person. You're not transitioning. You're not actually selling a copy. Right. So uh, with with the NFT, right, with the NFT, when you sell that NFT, you can specify copyright and licensing uh, parameters and rules in the smart contract. Embedded in the token. So if you want to say, hey, you have a license or excuse me. You, yeah. Yeah. You have a license to showcase this for however amount of time you can put it on shirts and you can put it on mugs, but you can only do it for five years. You can specify that. You can specify that, hey, you can make money on off of this up to a certain dollar amount. Once you hit $100,000, you can no longer do any reproduction of the certain. You can specify all of that. But know that if you just buying an NFT doesn't automatically give you copyrights. All right? Number two, you have to be very, very careful of uh, the creator of the NFT. Okay? Anybody can go and create an NFT and put a picture up and say, hey, I want to sell this. This is an original piece of art, and I'm the owner of the piece. Might not even be the actual artist. Might not even. Might be Joe Blow from across the street, right? There are platforms. So what is, what is the safeguard in place uh, for something like so, that? So, like, uh, so that? Some, some platforms... Some platforms go through a verification process to set up an account, right? They ask you to submit certain identification and attach to certain social networks to actually validate your identity. Some just put out a disclaimer. They say, hey, this is what's going on. You have to make sure that you do your due diligence to make sure that the person that creates the, F the NFT is actually who they are, right? So you have to be, be aware of that when you're in, in the marketplace. Make sure that the person that created the NFT is actually the owner of the NFT and has the rights to sell said NFT. Okay. Uh, thirdly, this doesn't sound like it's for the casual. <laughs> this is a lot. Yes. This is like you're a collector and you care. Like. Yes. Yes. So the definitely for the collectors or so so for people that um, uh, uh, what are the kids use today? Like clout, right? Right for the for the for the uh, uh, oh, yeah. coolness factor. Right to be able to say I have this or I have this original piece. So there was only four it's or five. Of this, right. So if you're in this market, right, it's a very very cool market. It's an emerge. It's an emerging market. It's a very popular market. But that is breeding scammers. And the biggest scam right now is people uploading NFTs that they don't own. All right. So be very very aware of the NFTs that you buy. Make sure that you validate the creator of said NFT. Um, next is uh, the storage of said content, right? So the storage of the content that you have on the NFT, right? So let's say this picture, right? How do I make sure that I always have access to this? Because it's digital, it's not physical. How do I make sure that in 30 years I have access to this? Well, as long as the blockchain exists, which we are banking that it will exist for the next 3,000 years, right? I'm a believer in that, 100% that that as long as the network is there as long as the the blockchain of ethereum is there your content will always be there right but that means that it's stored on the network transactions to create nfts and buy them go through a transaction right and that transaction costs that's why it's also not for your just casual art collector right now because every time you buy an nft you have to pay a price to do that transaction and the price depends on how large the nft is so if you're buying a picture it may be 10 cents if you're buying a full video that's three four minutes long 4K. that's fully 4k you might be sending over two or three gigs which might cost you like 40 50 bucks right those aren't actual numbers but you're you know you kind of you know you're kind of gauging right so when you get into the nfc game there's uh, uh the the understanding of where your content is being stored so when you're talking about 
uh, the storage of your NFT. You have to be able to either store it on the uh, Ethereum blockchain, right? Which is gonna hold storage space on the blockchain or you can store it on an offsite server, right? And give somebody a link that points to that offsite server that holds the content. However, there's there's no rules on on how long that information should be there, who should govern it, like who who should it's manage this, right? So you could buy an NFT, somebody could post a link and then disable the link five days from now, and now you lost you lost your content, right? So getting into this new emerging game, you have to educate yourself. Right. It is emerging. That means that there are not concrete rules and parameters around this. So educate yourself. The last one is, you know, a lot of people ask why NFTs? Why is this so cool? Again, we bring back to sports cards, back to art. Right. People buy art to showcase it in their house. Right. To start conversations, but to showcase that, you know, hey, I may know about this or I'm of a certain status. I'm of a certain class. I'm of a certain niche group. Right. There is there is value in that. There's a cultural component to art like the point at which we advanced as you know the culture of humans is when we were like okay we actually don't have to hunt and gather all damn day we have time we can create so there's value in that process of creation that you know we place on it as a society Mm -hmm. and and um so the a question is how are people going to showcase this like yeah okay now i have this piece of art but i can also go google it and see it right so what what's the coolness of me having it what it's people that certificate of authenticity correct the certificate of, authentic, of, of authenticity is is created when you mint the nft right when you mint that nft you create that one version or that one series you create that uniqueness right you create that scarce availability right and with anything with supply and demand if you increase the demand for something and there's a low supply of it you can be able to monetize it and that's where the creatives come in right to be able to uh, find a a new way to be able to monetize their digital artwork right and so if you're into that sort of thing this is the marketplace for you Uh, if you are somebody that wants to collect it but don't know how to showcase it those are things that they're trying to figure out right now the best ways cool ways to you know, mount them in certain TVs, mount them in displays, mount them in cars, mount them in watches, Phones, mount them in iPads, certain ways using using augmented reality and set them up in certain ways. There's digital museums that are spurring up right now that are that are occurring, um, and, and it's kind of setting the precedent for how new interactive museums, right, are the going to be curated. Yeah, are going to be cur- curated. Um, there's uh, auction houses right now. I, uh, Beeple. Beeple's the uh, biggest artist right now that sold one of his NFT pieces of artwork. It was done through the Christie um, Auction House, right? Sold for over $60 million. One piece of digital art sold over $60 million. Jack Dorsey, the creator of Twitter, sold his first tweet for over $2 million. A tweet. <laughs> That's just wild. Uh, Top Shot. Top Shot, like I told you, who was selling the NBA, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, uh, uh, selling the uh, NBA NFTs. Uh, they've, I think, they're over four hundred million in revenue since October. Over four hundred million in revenue since October. Somebody buying these NFTs. Topshot.com, check them out. <laughs> right, somebody's out here buying them, and some people are putting up some cool stuff. Right. You know who needs to put up an NFT? There are these, I can't remember the name of the creator. There's a video editor that be making these um, edits over um, NBA highlights where the player like fall into the gr- like a grave Instagram, yeah. or like they go into a portal to like mm-hmm. another dimension or they soul leave their body or some crazy shit like that. There, there was a, a meme, uh, the seller of a meme, he sold the original meme as the creator of the NFT and creator of, of the meme. It was his image. He sold it for, I think it, he sold it for twenty or $30,000. Right. There's somebody out there that sold um, uh, they sold a, uh, an audio recording of their farts for over four hundred thousand like, dollars. <laughs> a whole song. That's that's wild. It's wild. So like, you know, that that's the scale right now. It's emerging. So you're, you're going to see your uh, your your novelty stuff. Right. But then you're going to see your high end stuff. And over time, you're going to see a good equilibrium of the two. I think this is a really good market for the creative. Um, it and, opens and, up and a for lot the tech, of for the technologists as well, and it's also good for investors in the crypt, in the crypto space, 
right? Um, last thing that I'll say before we exit, because I know that we gotta go. Um, last thing is uh, the other applications, right? How else can NFTs be used outside of the art world, right? Uh, they can be used uh, for event tickets, right? To the selling of event tickets, to pair the selling of this to a certain person. So if you buy this event ticket, you can always say, oh, hey, this is the public address of this person. They have this event ticket. So that can decrease scalpers, right? It can uh, decrease um, people trying to sneak into venues, right? Um, there's also supply chains for companies to be able to verify their products for their uh, uh, replenishment system. There's uh, verifying of legal documentation, right? For the, for the movement of that. There's the verifying of health documentation, yeah, right? That's what, that's what having a ledger, went, yep, yeah. yep. Having a, a full av available ledger. Uh, or even that, like a citizen ID. Like mm -hmm. you yourself are the NFT. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, um, the applications for NFT right now are, are focused on the creative, um, but but over time, guys, there, there's going to be gonna so many other, other industries, markets. and you're, you're going to see this. You're going to see the, the ability to be able to, one, buy NFTs for an investment purpose, but also to then be able to use the blockchain to become more of a digital citizen, right? And so we'll, we'll have more talks about what the digital citizen is and the pros and cons of that, of, you know, putting all your personal data in a blockchain and having it saved and managed and be available to other companies. But then, you know, the, but there's the public and the private, you know, how, you know, how does that, uh, uh, how does that conflict yeah, that? with your own personal privacy? So, um, I think that that wraps up our conversation with NFTs. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, yeah. that's all we have for you folks. Good, good. So, um, yeah, thank you guys for listening. Um, we are, I think we're out at our fifth podcast. Yeah, this is episode right five. Now. Um, and so, you know, guys, we're taking this all, all in stride. Um, we just learned a couple of production elements here to kind of uh, help with our audio. Step up the game. Um, you know, we're working better on our note taking and the organization of the podcast. So, um, you know, we're we're new to this. You know, we're not professionals in this space, um, in the recording space or um, in the financial space, you know, but um, open to feedback. If very, you guys very have open any to feedback, of course. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're just happy to share our opinions with you. Right. So um, any feedback that, that you guys have, definitely reach us, uh, reach out to us here on the shop or on our website. Um, at Josh with a genius. That's genius with a J dot com. Um, telephone number is 340-227-3821. Um, and if you're local here in St. Thomas, definitely come by and visit us here in the shop. Um, we're here at 5333 Rod Escada, um, right here on the heart of Main Street. Uh, we're right across from Stonehouse Cafe, right next door to Valentine's Jewelers. On um, second floor, uh, right above where Crazy Cow used to be. Um, so, Sarah, if you don't have anything, I'm going to sign out. You guys have a good day. Roger that. Peace. <laughs>